Hello, welcome to lecture two, materials and techniques. I've decided to break this lecture up into two parts as well. So here is part one, two dimensional or 2D media. Feel free to pause this video at any point to take notes of terminology, definitions, and other relevant information. Two dimensional or 2D media are artworks that contain height and width, but not depth. The first type of 2D media we will look at today is drawing. Drawing serves many purposes for artists. Artists draw to express ideas, refine plans, prepare for larger projects, make adjustments, and record their observations. Though many drawings are done as a preliminary stage for other artistic productions, drawings can be finished fine art products on their own. For centuries, artists have created drawings as a way to visually represent ideas they have in their minds. In the 15th century, Leonardo da Vinci created a multitude of drawings to represent ideas he had for a wide variety of inventions and contraptions, such as a flying machine pictured here. In this sense, da Vinci used drawing as a way to put his concepts into a more tangible form without knowing whether or not the larger flying machine project would ever be manifested. There are two types of drawing that we are going to view, dry media and wet media. Dry media consist of drawing techniques that do not require a liquid, whereas wet media do. Our first type of dry media here is charcoal, a chalk-like substance that often comes in various shades of dark brown or black. It is easy to smudge and easy to manipulate. In this drawing, Kolwitz used the charcoal stick to create a variety of lines, shadows, and textures. You can see where she made bigger movements, flattening the charcoal lengthwise against the paper and moving it up and down in broad strokes to create her arm and her chest. You can also see where she used the tip of the charcoal stick to create refined and detailed lines to depict her facial features. This is the appealing quality of charcoal. It can be used to create more abstract gestures as well as finer, more subtle, and illusionistic details. Crayon, pastel, and chalk are similar to charcoal in the sense that they're all made of powdered substances bound with some sticky binder and usually fabricated into a stick form. The main difference is that crayon, pastel, and chalk are powdered versions of pigment, the chemical substances that create colors. Artists will use crayon, pastel, or chalk in similar ways as they use charcoal, to draw quickly, to blend colors and tones easily, and to practice specific technical skills. Artists like Michelangelo have traditionally used crayon or chalk to work through visual challenges and preparatory sketches for larger projects. Here, Michelangelo was working on some difficult contours, angles, and movements of the human body with red chalk on paper. The human figure and other features in this drawing were good practice for a much larger project that would challenge Michelangelo to paint across the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in Rome, which has amazed viewers for its astonishing realism since it was completed in 1512. Nearly 400 years later, Degas used pastel to also practice portraying the more challenging angles, shapes, and movements of the human body. Degas was interested in capturing the surprising qualities of our ordinary movements, using his artwork to bring attention to the unique angles and shapes we create without thinking. Pastel was a useful choice for capturing brief and fleeting moments such as what we see here since it allowed him to portray the scene quickly. Drawing can also be done with liquid, often by putting ink in a pen or on a brush. Unlike the dry media, ink is permanent and difficult to blend or alter once placed on a surface. Still, skilled artists have enjoyed working with ink to create more contrast and other effects in their drawings. Here, Van Gogh created a stunning effect by using brown ink with a pen on paper. There is no subtle blending or shading of colors and tones here, as we saw in previous slides. Instead, Van Gogh's, 
suggests the textures and distances of both the sower, the human figure, and the wheat field around him just by using alternating patterns of short parallel lines. In this way, he requires fewer realistic details for us to understand the features of what we see before us. Rather than emphasizing naturalism, though, Van Gogh allows a more stylized and abstracted image to convey the mood and meaning of this scene. A hardworking sower at the end of the day, gliding through the large stretch of the field that he had presumably just worked. In addition to placing ink inside a device such as a pen, many ink drawings are done by dipping a device such as a brush into a container of ink. Many of the world's most accomplished brush drawing artists have come from China, where this medium is used for some of the most revered practices in that country's history, calligraphy, painting, and poetry. For example, here we see how brush and ink have been used to combine text and imagery in the same visual space. The artist moves the brush at different angles and presses with different levels of pressure to achieve the small fine lines as well as the larger broad strokes. It takes a great amount of skill and confidence to produce a work as precise as this brush and ink image. Painting is one of the most universal methods of art production in the history of humankind. Instead of combining pigments in a sticky binder, like the dry media, with painting, pigments are mixed with liquid binders. There are many different types of painting, so we are going to look at some materials used and what kinds of visual effects they create for both artists and viewers. The first type of painting we will look at is called encaustic. This is a process where pigment is mixed with hot liquid wax, and artists move this colorful waxy substance with the help of a palette knife or other device. The final product is flexible in texture and can be glossy in appearance. Here we have an example of an encaustic painting on a wood support. Since the encaustic can be quite bendy and flexible when it dries, it needs to have a solid backing so it doesn't crack or break. I'm always impressed at how this artist was able to create such a lifelike appearance by manipulating this waxy substance, using the encaustic to create subtle highlights and shadows. Fresco is a painting method that is defined by both the paint and the support. In the case of fresco, pigments are mixed with water and applied to a fresh plaster when it is still wet. As the plaster dries, it absorbs the paint into it, making both the paint and the support one and the same thing. When done in this way, fresco is extremely permanent and is one of the few art forms still visible from ancient civilizations around the world. Here we have Michelangelo's finished product, a detail of the enormous fresco cycle on the Sistine Chapel ceiling in Rome. Fresco tends to be lighter in color when it dries than it appears when wet, but it still has the ability to create illusionistic effects when done well. Everything we see in this image was painted in fresco by Michelangelo, but he tricks our eyes into thinking that we see elements of different materials and textures, from the stone columns and sculptures to the lifelike sibyl and angels in the center. Tempera can look similar to fresco, since tempera also tends to dry lighter in color than it is applied when wet. However, tempera is a paint made up of pigment and egg, often egg yolk, mixed together before being applied to a surface. Artists apply tempera with a brush and need to work quickly since it dries so fast. In this slide, we see the large painting by the artist Giotto di Bondone, better known as Giotto. Like many tempera paintings from the Renaissance and earlier, this one was done on panel, or a support made of wood, which allowed the tempera paint to stand out against the backdrop rather than be completely absorbed into it. Giotto successfully adjusted the colors in subtle ways to suggest real weight and volume for these figures. 
Despite the striking gold backdrop and the hierarchical scale of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus seated on her lap, this scene still contains a surprising amount of realism because of the highlights and shadows seen clearly in the folds of the drapery over the bodies of the figures. During the Renaissance in Europe, oil paint became more widely produced and utilized by artists. With oil paint, pigment is mixed with an oil binder, like linseed oil, rather than water or egg yolk. This produces a much richer, more intense, and highly saturated effect in color, which has been used to enhance the realism in painting since the 15th century. The Flemish painter Jan van Eyck is credited with being one of the earliest and most successful employers of oil paint. Here we see how he used oil paint to increase the amount of careful highlighting and shadow in this scene to make the features look even more realistic. With oil paint, even different textures become more easily recognizable, such as the smooth stone of the columns in contrast with the lush, soft fabrics. Our last type of 2D media to explore is called printmaking. Specifically, we are going to look at types of what is known as relief printmaking, or the type that removes material in the production process. Ink is usually placed onto the material or into the spaces left behind, and paper is placed onto the material and then pressed to transfer the image to the paper. One of the most common types of relief printmaking is known as woodblock, sometimes referred to as woodcut. This term refers to when the material used to make the original image is wood. Here we can see the individual steps involved in making a woodblock print. First, you prepare the woodblock with your image and place it down with the image facing up. Then you cut away the parts around your image to leave it raised and exposed. That raised portion remaining is then the part that receives the ink. And the final step is to press it onto a sheet of paper and the image is left behind on the paper to create a print. Unlike paintings and drawings, prints can be reproduced or duplicated, meaning the artist can create several copies out of only one original block of wood. Because of this, prints have traditionally offered viewers a more affordable way to own and collect art for personal use and display. The German Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer was well known for his skill in painting and printmaking. Here is one of his woodcut or woodblock prints. Imagine the careful detail and precision required to carve out such tiny and exact lines to create this image. No wonder he wanted to display his initials so clearly at the bottom. Intaglio printing, also known as engraving, is still relief printing, but rather than carving away material, the material is etched away and the ink is placed in the empty recesses left behind. Here are the steps of intaglio printmaking. First, the image is etched onto a metal plate. The instrument used to engrave the plate is called a burin, and the edge is very sharp in order to cut into the plate which is often made of copper. Once the image is engraved, ink is applied to the entire plate, then wiped away, leaving ink only in the engraved portions. Then the paper is placed on the plate and both are squished together when sent through machine press. When they are pulled apart, the image is transferred to the paper. We will finish this part of the lecture with another example of Dürer's excellent printmaking skills. Here we see another image loaded with fine lines and details, but this time they have all been carefully engraved out of a metal plate rather than cut out of a block of wood. Still, this was a complicated enough challenge that Dürer celebrated its completion by including his name clearly on the placard hanging off the branch in Adam's hand.
This concludes part one on 2D media of lecture two, materials and techniques.